Hi there, Rob McGregor here, and welcome to our end of June edition of On Track. I'm recording this in sunny Noosa on the 31st of July, um, and this will be our, our year end um, edition where we'll look at the returns uh, for, the, for the June 30 year. And they're the returns that are often compared to other figures you may see in the public, so quite an important one. Hope you've all been well and staying safe but staying active uh, during what is an incredibly interesting time in human history. Let me dive in. So firstly, um, yeah, as always, general advice warning, this presentation is a monthly presentation designed for clients of McGregor Wealth Management. Anyone else who comes across this, um, feel free to take what you can out of this, but please get advice that's suitable to your own circumstances before acting on anything. In today's session, I'm going to look at the economic news and still massively dominated by COVID and the damage that's happening there. I'm going to put it into context and I'm going to go over some stuff we did, we talked about last month, and that is the pros and cons of what might cause the market to rise at the moment and the, the, the kind of things that are going to hold it back. But I'm going to have, a, have a, a talk about interest rates and low interest rates, how low they are in the context of history and what that means for us as investors. And I'll update you through the key markets that we invest in and as always aim to put that in perspective as to what that means to you. So in terms of the news highlights, it's um, yeah, it's a bit, uh, whatever the right word is, sad, but yeah, the news is dominated by COVID and it gets more and more, more and more specific as I speak in this, uh, the media are all over those, uh, the, the two girls or three girls, however many it is, that have bought COVID up from Melbourne and the media is just loving it as always. Now, yes, people should be accountable. Yes, they're going to do that. But the media is so into um, whatever seems the worst as always. So we've had the second wave um, in Melbourne, a bit of little spot fires in Sydney, but Sydney at this point, at the point of recording, looks like they've actually got it traced and connected. We've seen uh, our Premier, for those of us in Queensland, um, love playing it tough at the moment, and she's massively supported by public opinion. So she's going to keep doing that. Um, that's keeping a handbrake on the tourism industry, um, particularly in North Queensland. Um, but it seems to be what the public have deemed to be okay, and that is what it is. Um, as I said, the media is focusing on the worst news, as always, wherever they can get it. We see a lot of economic data coming out. As you get to the end of every month, you know, we've just had record low inflation numbers come out. Um, we've got you know, record high unemployment. Just keep in mind, all of these measures are looking backwards. Um, and while they're important, they tell us how bad things have been and are right now. They don't tell us what's going to happen next and they reflect what we know and what the market already knows. So the market is, is a forward thinking uh, beast. It's known that the news was going to be bad since the market started crashing. That's why it started to crash because it knew the news was going to be bad. So the the data that is coming out now is just confirmation of what the market already knew. So any reactions from the market to that news will be calibrating. If the news is slightly worse than expected, you'll see the market drop slightly. If the news was slightly better than expected, you'll see the market go up. But just that, you know, and it, it amazes some people. They sit there and they hear worst unemployment for have a, have a long and they think the market should drop when that news comes out, but the market already knew that was going to happen. So very important to, to always be aware of that. Uh, we've seen the government's response continue. They've extended JobKeeper and the higher job seeker payments to March 21. There's a, a tapering down of that and businesses are going to have to re-qualify. Um, they won't be able to rely on April being down. They're going to have to prove that every, every three months that their figures are down. 30% for small businesses. Now that's a good thing. Um, the economy being kept alive by government help is, is a necessary part of the shutdown. Um, otherwise there would be so many businesses on their knees. This would absolutely be um, way, way worse than it is. So our government has acted responsibly. They've acted um, not, too, not too hot with this, not too cold. I believe they've got it just about right. 
there will be a bill to pay, but we'll, we've got time to pay that. And I'm going to talk about how interest rates affect that bill in this particular um, episode. Yeah, just when we think we might be able to think about travelling, look what happens. The Melbourne second wave hit and all all potential to travel um, overseas is probably gone for a while yet. Even interstate travel, we're, we're seeing the craziness of um, Clive Palmer challenging the High Court Western Australia's decision to hard close its border. It's actually being supported by the federal government. And their issue is you can stop people coming in who've been to hotspots but don't close the whole border because at the moment that border is closed to people from Northern Territory who have no cases, from people from far North Queensland who have no cases. It's kind of irrational. Um, But also respect the rights of those in WA and places like that to, to, to supposedly protect. We're seeing this rise of isolationism and that's where people who have low degrees of the virus say, well, we don't actually want anyone else to come here. Now, generally, the people that say that are either in the danger zone health-wise um, or they've got very safe employment. For those people in business, particularly business affected by um, tourism, travel, hospitality, those things, they are not necessarily echoing those same sentiments because they know how tough their business is during these times. But it's it's fascinating. Everyone gets a right to their opinion. Um, We've still got more stimulus coming. There's there's been extensions to the 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 renos. Um, yeah, you can reno your house and get um, some government funding for it. New new. There's been a steady rise in new um, building contracts. So there's a lot of young people that are, are taking advantage of the government's uh, generosity here to sign house and land packages. Once again, it's pretty good policy. It's going to keep the um, the building industry going. And those things had to happen before December, so it's for immediate action. And you've heard um, some people talk about shovel-ready projects. So they're trying to make sure where the government's offering assistance, that is for stuff that's ready to go relatively soon to fill in the hole. Um, And I think we're gonna see some more of that. I think we're gonna see more of infrastructure being brought forward, and these are good things. As we look through uh, our media across the the Pacific to our friends in the US, it just looks crazier and crazier. Um, I can't believe some of the some of the stuff going in the presidential campaign. I lament at the quality of both candidates. Um, yeah, I just think it's crazy. And I watch the civil unrest there. I've got good friends and family in the States who I get good updates from. I don't think the vision we see on the TV, I, I think that's real by the way, but the, the, the broader masses, it's not as bad. Keep in mind point number one there, the media loves showing us the worst of whatever's going on. So what we see from the US, what we see from other places is the worst of it. They're not showing us the good things that are happening. And there's good things happening everywhere, of course, as there always is. So just remember to apply that filter. But yes, it's crazy. And the beauty of the system is each president only gets a maximum of two terms. So regardless of the outcome here, yeah, the polls are showing um, Trump behind by 10 to 15%. They were showing him behind last time, so there's not a lot of faith in those polls. And the the system over there is so complex, it relies on voter turnout and it relies on their electorate, the college electorate system, which means you've got to win the most votes, not from the public, but the way that system works, which where is individual states become critical. You win individual states and you've got to obviously have a majority there. So it's going to be fascinating entertainment and yeah, anyway. I'm not going to go into it too deep. It creates a lot of um, divided opinion in many circles. More so over there, their system is so bipartisan. And by that I mean, if you're a Republican over there, you would never vote Democrat. And if you're a Democrat, you'd never vote Republican. I feel like Australians are more open, or at least the middle, of potentially voting where merit is due. Uh, Whereas in America, they seem to just argue whatever their own party is. We got a bit of it here, but I don't think it's quite as bad. And anyway, as always, the trillion dollar question, what happens next? So let me get into some other bits and pieces. Now, on request from some of our clients, some of our clients like hearing the summary at the start and they like hearing the performance, but they're not necessarily interested in some of the detail. So I've I've thrown our summary of the performance to the front here. And it's interesting to look in 
So if we look at the five-year performance at the moment compared to, say, those long-term targets, it's slightly under those long-term targets, but not by much. And keep in mind, inflation at the moment is about 1.5%. So those five-year returns are probably 1% under the long-term target. But that's not bad considering that we're in a downturn. If you want to really look at long-term targets, you need to look at either downturn to downturn or, or highs to high or average to average. But at the moment, we've got a, a, negative, yeah, a negative year in there. And you can see when we look at one month, one month is positive. Three months is very positive. It shows how far the market's bounced back since the start of April. So high growth funds up about 12%. But that was giving back what they gave up in the, the, the three months before there. So for the six months, high growth is down. For one year, it's down. Most of our clients, when you go to the bottom table there, most of our clients in those particular risk profiles are about square or down 1% to 2% um, for the year. So our, our, our clients that, who are younger and dollar cost averaging have had the benefit of buying into markets while they've been down. And our retired clients have had the benefit of their reserve strategy, buffering performance as well. So yeah, we're, as much as we don't like flat or, or negative numbers, we're, we're quite happy with the performance of the portfolios. And more importantly, they've meant that our clients don't need to panic, don't need to sell, don't need to change their strategy, which means they will achieve their goals in the long run. So just a reminder that, that, that those pillars that make that up, um, the, the care strategy, yeah, the, the, the core portfolios are, are, are based on what I'd call that modern portfolio theory. So we have a good asset allocation. We then pick assets that match that asset allocation that are low cost, diversify and rebalance regularly. As an example, the core portfolio that, that sits under the bonnet for all our clients, those have been rebalanced three times during this downturn. So that just means we're keeping up to date. So when the market was down, we were rebalancing. That means we were buying more shares at that point, which is when you want to be buying more shares when they're cheap. And as markets come back up, we rebalance that back to normal. Rebalancing will generally account for a good half to 1% of extra return over a year when it's done well. The biggest issue in a crisis is number two here, managing investor behavior. And that's making sure um, that we don't make bad decisions, that we continue to make good decisions, that we don't mess it up. And I'm going to talk about that. And I'm going to touch on a bit of history as we go through this. And keep in mind, we always believe that all investing should be part of a plan that's based on your goals. And when that's done, it gives you context for whenever we're going through less than fantastic times. Um, that context, we assess where the market's at um, from you know, the crazy FOMO, the boom times, to wall of worry, which is the wow, wall of worry, at the rest of the times. At the moment, we have the market at fair value, generally across the board. There's some slight differences in some of the markets, but we believe it's a fair time to be investing. We say that with the degree of, um, without knowing the future exactly, it, it, this is not a precise science. We think it's a good time. We think when you look back in 10 years, we'll be happy that we invested at these sort of levels. The market is likely to be up strongly from there. What it does in the next year is always uncertain, but that's the price that long-term investors pay for getting above average returns at the moment, because the only alternative to markets is cash, and I'm gonna talk about interest rates in a minute. So we, we've got the market at fair value at the moment. Out of my mess it up acronym here, and mess it up is just the acronym for the way people lose money in the market, and you can read those, but it's yeah, too much attention to the media, focus on short-term issues, and it's letting the emotions get the better, and things like that. I'm gonna talk a bit today about short-term focus, and it's so easy at the moment to be stuck in this short-term focus, to be trying to predict what happens next with COVID, what happens next with lockdowns, what happens next with the economy, and I'm less concerned about what happens next as the bigger picture is, do we get back to normal? And I have no reason to believe we don't get back to normal, which means markets will eventually you know, go up quite well from here. What happens in the next months or, or year even? Very hard to tell. We've seen markets go sideways for a, a few months now, and I'll talk more about that. But that's because we've, we've, we've recovered somewhat. We're now pausing to wait to see what happens next. But be very mindful of focusing too much on what's happening in the short term, particularly around these economic figures that are being released. Um, and I'm going to look at one of these short term focuses at the moment, um, which is interest rates. But before I do that, just a reminder that 
You've just lived through the fifth worst market downturn in history, and you've all survived with, with portfolios that are flat over the last year. Um, so that puts in perspective. We tend to look back on things and say, wow, I wouldn't want that to happen. But they're actually not as bad as people think if you're managing your money well and if it's being managed as part of a long-term plan. So even in the fifth worst downturn in the last 120 years in the Australian market, um, you're, you're flat to slightly you know, 1%, 2% at worst negative. So it's not too bad. And we've got a whole lot of upside when you look at all of those previous downturns, what the market does from the bottoms for the next 10 years is usually pretty good. So investing during a recession, investing during a downturn, or at least staying invested is always a good thing to happen when you look back over time. So it's a time to remain strong um, with your investments. Let's have a look at interest rates and they are the lowest in our living history. Let me qualify that. I don't actually know what interest rates were. Um, when Adam was a boy, as they say, or what they were back in the, the Middle Ages. Um, but I'm assuming they would be competing with anything we've ever had in history, but certainly in documented history. Um, on the left-hand side of the screen here, you'll see Australian rates, government bond yields. And the yield column is the third column there. So for a 10-year government bond, you're getting 0.85 of 1%. So every year for the next 10 years, if you bought a government bond, you'll get less than 1%. So if you were a retiree and you had a million dollars invested in Australian government bonds from here, you're gonna get eight and a half thousand dollars a year. Now contrast that to someone who hasn't saved a cent for retirement, who's got, a, who's got no money, they'd be getting $37,000 from the government for an age pension. So a massive contrast. That's gonna to lead to some interesting behaviors because for people that are too conservative in their investments, they can't live off that at the moment. So they only have two choices. They can drop what they spend. They can keep spending what they're doing and, and spend the kids inheritance so they can draw down capital. Or they can start to look to invest in areas that might have a higher return. So that historically will drive people into share markets that shouldn't be there. It will drive them into um, riskier fixed income investments. And I see that as a massive danger when people start chasing high yielding investments that often end in tears during these things where you're taking a much bigger risk. So just one other point to note there, if you look at the 10 year bond rate there, you'll see that there's an example of a current 10 year bond that has a coupon rate of two and a half percent. So if you go back just a couple of years, they were issuing government bonds at two and a half percent. So those bonds have actually made a 15% capital gain because interest rates have dropped. So what happens with bonds is when rates drop, you make a gain, but with rates now at 0.8, it's, it's, it's hard to see them going much lower, although you will see some negative interest rates um, in some of these things. But to make a gain out of your bonds, you'd have to see rates go negative. Now the flip side is what worries us, and when I say us, that's the, the GPS Investment Committee more, is if rates do eventually go back to normal, you'll see the reverse of this. So a government bond being issued at 1%, say, if interest rates jumped to a whole 3%, would see a loss of about 15%. So that makes long-term bonds particularly, um, what I call risk um, asymmetric. That means I believe the downside risk is now higher than the upside risk. So we don't hold uh, almost any long-term government bonds. We hold much shorter duration, almost cash-like securities in the fixed income portfolios. If you look at the cash rate at the moment, it's 0.25. A year ago it was 1% and we thought that was low. If you go to the UK, that's the gilt yields. You'll see 10 year bonds in, in the UK are at 0.09 of a percent. That's 0.09, not 0 0.9, 0 0.09. So it's not even one tenth of a percent. So that's as close to zero. And a five year rate in the UK is now negative, negative one point, negative 0.14%. So which is quite crazy. Uh, Bank of England cash rate is 0.1%. Go to the States and they don't have negative rates, but they've got super low rates. Their 10 year government bond rate or the yield is 0.5%, so half percent. If you give your money to the US government for 30 years, you'll get 1.2%. It's absolutely amazing. And it creates for some interesting conversations. As I said, one of the impacts is people who are invested in interest rate securities 
as seeing them, them get no return. Now they get their return of capital. Um, so it suits those that are scared of everything else, um, in, of investing in shares, investing in property, investing in absolutely anything else. So it is the safest investment there is. US treasuries, Australian government bonds, UK um, government bonds, they're about as safe as it gets in the world. But you get, now get no, no return. You get your return of capital, but you get no return on capital. So that's going to lead a lot of people to move up the risk spectrum. As I said, they'll start by buying shares like Telstra or the banks where they will look at those higher dividends and think they're safe, even though we know those companies can go down and all of them have gone down by somewhere between 20 and 50% at different times in the last decade. Um, but for now, we're going to see money flow into the share market. And that brings me into the case for a rising share market. And one of the cases here, I'm going to look at the case for... Uh, for caution the share market as well to balance that out but low interest rates will drive share markets when professional fund managers value the share market to say it's at fair value they use an interest rate to compare it to and the rate most of them are using is still the old government bond rates of about three percent if you actually put in the current 10-year government bond rates into those valuation models share market looks fair value at nine or 10,000 for the ASX 200, and it's 6,000 right now. Now, no one's doing that yet, but we may see this happen over time. If interest rates stay lower for longer, people might start to say, well, you can justify higher share prices because of low interest rates. If you put your money in the bank, you get half a percent. If you put it in the market, you get 5%. Therefore, I'm willing to pay more for the share market. So we will see that that happen. That'll start by investors chasing high yielding stocks. And we've already seen this like Telstra, like the banks, like property trusts. I, I believe it's very dangerous to chase yield. You're much better off to have a broader portfolio and run a reserve strategy like we do. Um, and now it also leads to speculation. So in, in low interest rates will lead those who've got money and who are doing okay. And keep in mind that's 60 to 70% of the population. So as the dust starts to settle here and these people start to realize, I've still got my job. I'm not spending money on travel. Maybe I'm gonna borrow and buy an investment property. Maybe I'll even borrow to buy some shares. So that money will go into the market that will support that. We're seeing a lot of human nature um, when we're talking to our clients, when we're watching our friends and family. Money in our pocket gets spent, um, particularly for most of the population. It can be a little bit different with some of our older clients who are sort of a bit more cautious. But most people, we're seeing uh, younger people on JobKeeper spend all their money. Um, I've got a friend that owns a restaurant down in Burley Heads, and he was saying all the people, all the hospitality workers down there who would normally be earning two or three hundred dollars um, a week have been earning their seven fifty, and they're spending it all. Now that's a good thing. You can argue, oh, we shouldn't be doing this, but it's a good thing because it's keeping the economy going, and we keep the economy going. That keeps the share market stable. Um, and people that aren't travelling overseas are buying new caravans, they're doing home renovations, they're going to Bunnings and fixing up the garden, they're buying furniture. These are good things as well. Now, this is possible because of that government stimulus. And what we've seen in the last month or the last two months is the government keep announcing extensions of this. So what they're really saying here is that if we keep getting bad news and if the economy stays sluggish, they're going to keep propping it up. Now, once again, that's a good thing. You can hear some people saying, oh, there's going to be a price to pay for this, and there will be, but let's get back to those low interest rates. For the governments to borrow right, the, the governments can fund this spending in two ways. They either borrow the money through government bonds, and if they're borrowing at the moment, they're paying 0.8 of a percent. So there's never been a cheaper time for the government to borrow money, or they can print money. They don't actually print money these days, they just buy back their own bonds. The federal, the federal um, Reserve Bank, the RBA, buys back government bonds and that puts that money back into circulation. And when you put more money back into circulation, that stimulates the markets, it stimulates the economy. So both those things are going to continue to happen while the economy is weak and that's a good thing. Now, it does kick the can down the road on economic responsibility. And there's a point if governments take it too far that it does lead to problems down the track and it will eventually lead to the need to tax more um, to pay that back. But if that's done, picture post 
um, depression and post-World War II. They were both cases where governments around the world eventually decided to spend lots of money and also to fund that through bonds, but also through um, quantitative easing or printing of money. And it led to really good economic stimulus that if they hadn't done it, we, the economy would have plotted along at, at, at not very good levels for a while. So it's a necessary part of the cycle. It's actually a good thing. Responsibly slowing it down is the trap, and, and that's where we've got to keep pressure on the politicians. But for now, they should be absolutely spending. And then it's just about the efficiency of that spending, getting it into projects that we need doing anyway. So bringing forward infrastructure spending, making sure that money gets put into the economy in, in the smartest possible way, um, yeah, and not just going on, on stuff. Yeah. And, and they're getting it fairly right. You can never get these things perfect, but generally they're doing a good job. We're seeing that around the world, uh, and that's gonna, that's gonna lead to the good companies around the world growing their profits, and that ultimately leads to, to the share market going up. Uh, and as we start to spend money around the world on infrastructure projects, that is generally good for commodity prices, and then we start to get the pendulum effect. As you know, markets are partly driven by, by numbers, but the numbers are pretty boring. You know, economies grow at two to three percent normally. Occasionally, we have a dip where it's shrunk a little bit, but markets can vary between yeah you know, plus twenty five percent and minus you know, ten percent. Um, so markets swing around a lot more, but that's because of this pendulum of, uh, of of psychology where we swing from fear to greed, from FOMO to to fear. So what you see when markets start to go up is people it build up their confidence. And money that doesn't normally find its way in the share market starts to find its way in the share market. And then the share market rises just because of that. And then people start to justify the current conditions. And that's when you're on your way to a boom that eventually leads to FOMO. Now, I say that quickly, but the reality is that kind of play out can take three, five, seven years. But I think we have just as much chance of the, that sort of cycle playing out in the next three, five, seven years as we do of a negative one, and probably more so. And the longer interest rates stay low and the longer government spending, the more likely we will come out of this eventually. And, it, and when I say come out, I mean come out strongly with the share market actually booming. And we will come out of this eventually. There's only, there's only been a handful of ways this thing finishes. One is, that when I say this thing, COVID, one is there's a vaccine and we've got confidence in it and people get vaccinated and we're back to normal. We fix the economic damage and we're back to normal. The other way is a treatment that means people don't get too sick or die. Um, and the other way is, is we just let it go and we accept that it's a part of life and herd immunity. Countries like Sweden have done that. And if you check out their case studies at the moment, it's actually looking like it's working for them with just as much economic cost, by the way, but they may do less economic damage in the long term. This is a very complex debate. There's no simple answer. I'm not going to do what a lot of the media and the social media people are doing of trying to simplify it. But it's, it's complex, but I have, have a very high confidence level that we come out of this okay, and we might even come out of it with, with markets racing, both share and property market, with some, with, some, with some wobbling around in the meantime. Now, on the negative case, the case for caution in the share market, is we don't know how much damage will have been done when we come out of this, when the, when the government stimulus stops. And when we see the businesses that don't open their doors again. Now keep in mind, that's a part of normal creative destruction in a capitalist world where badly run businesses go out of business, particularly at tough times in the cycle, and their customers go to well-run businesses. So that means good businesses get better, those businesses are in the share market and they go up. We don't know how long this is gonna to take to recover because we don't know how long it is till we're back to traveling. Look at the poor airline industry that's in the heart of this. So many planes around the world are grounded and yeah, pilots being told yeah, you might not be back flying internationally until next September uh, is what we hear. Um, so we just don't know how long that takes. But then on the flip side, as I said, vaccine comes up you know, towards the end of the year and we might be back sooner than we think. Um, always the reminder, unemployment does take longer to recover than people think. It, it goes up really quickly. We went from 5% to 10% in three months. It won't go back to 5% in three months. It'll probably take one to three years to get back to those levels. And that depends on how long this thing goes for. 
Um, I've talked about the treatment, I've talked about that. If we don't get a vaccination, there's some parts of the world which will stay closed for longer. I think places like New Zealand and places that have aimed for eradication won't be opening up except to other countries that have eradicated without a vaccination or a treatment. Um, we're seeing that even amongst states in Australia. It appears like some states like WA are trying to eradicate. I, I feel like it's impossible to eradicate a virus like this without keeping your borders permanently closed. And if you keep your borders per perfectly closed, you are killing uh, a massive chunk of your economy. I don't think that's sustainable. I think eventually, and I, I think eventually people will do that. We'll, we'll, we'll put pressure on governments to open up. But on the counter side of that, I'm seeing incredible public support for closed borders. In, in Queensland, um, I think the Premier is seeing 70% support for her border closures. And just when she was getting a bit of pressure on it, we get those second and third waves and that support goes back up again. So I don't necessarily agree with that approach, but I'm just being very pragmatic that when a politician looks at the polls and sees 70% support for something, watch them double down. They will not be uh, game to move away from that. So it's a pity. Um, it is costing um, areas of Queensland, particularly North Queensland, the further you get away from Brisbane, lots and lots of money. If you rule Sydney out of that tourism occasion, as well as Melbourne, uh, those areas will suffer massively. And that leads to all sorts of other problems, not just um, COVID, and they're, they're well spoken about. Um, we've got this whole isolation of, uh, isolationism thing leads to trade wars. We've got the US, China. We've now got China, Australia. We've got China versus everyone at the moment trying to stamp their place in the world. Um, so we're going to see some more of that, and that, that might be a case for caution. And governments aren't getting this completely right, which is impossible, by the way. There's no way anyone foresaw this. There's no way governments could have acted perfectly. There's some mistakes that look like shockers in hindsight. In Australia, the way we handled the cruise ships and the way we handle hotel quarantine look terrible in hindsight. But hindsight's a perfect thing. And of course, always one of the case for cautions is with um, another black swan. And a black swan event is just something that happens that no one thought would happen. Um, like, like a world war or something like that. Not that we like, we get that. So they're the cases. I think they balance out evenly at the moment. That's why we think the market is fair value. I do think the risk to the upside is more asymmetric than the risk to the downside. So I'll say that again, it's a big word. I mean, the, the downside is probably only small in that five, 10, worst case, 20% sort of range. Uh, you can never say never on those things, but the upside risk is, is big. That means if, we, if governments keep spending the way they're spending and we get a cure, treatment, whatever, and we get back, there's a fair chance the world goes into its next boom and watch the markets race ahead if that happens. But for right now, fairly evenly balanced. It's a good time to invest in the share market. At least you're gonna get some returns compared to cash. So quickly through the markets, the Aussie share market was up 2.5% in the last month. It's down 7% for the year, but its long-term returns are still very good in a low inflation return, and we rate that at fair value. US shares were down in Australian terms, just over 1% for the last, last month. They're up 8% for the year, which is quite staggering, uh, and it shows you once again the importance of diversification. And over five years, you've got 12% from being in the US shares, even during this downturn. So very important, and that's why we have such diversified portfolios. And we rate that as fair, although it's starting to get just a little bit upside of fair, uh, the US market, but not in any sort of danger territory whatsoever. US small caps, um, a slight positive for the month, um, down 10% for the year, very similar to the Australian market, the way it's tracking at the moment. This had been one of the best performers in the portfolio up to a year ago. Um, the, 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 the COVID took a bigger toll on that, um, but it kind of needed a bit of a break anyway. We actually view it as fair and maybe even slightly on the cheap side at the moment. So very important part of portfolios. Global leaders, these are the top 100 companies of the world. So slightly up for the month, very much up for the year, up 12% for the year. That's because these leaders includes people like Amazon, Facebook, Google, who are actually doing extremely well during these times. So the global leaders have done very well. That means that their prices have been pushed up. And in Australian terms, we're higher now than we were a year ago. And over the last 10 years, once again, around that 
so very healthy, but not, not crazy high. So once again, we're happy with fair value there, slightly above, but not too much. Emerging markets uh, copped it badly. They're down 8% over this period of time. Uh, trade wars tend to hurt emerging markets more so, but we're gonna see some of these emerging markets benefit quite strongly. A lot of countries have decided they don't wanna depend on China for all their manufacturing. So that we're seeing some moves of manufacturing to places like Vietnam, Africa, um, Malaysia, other emerging market economies, and that's good for those markets. We do think emerging markets are cheap. They're always more volatile. That's why they carry just a small place in the portfolio, but a very important part as well. And gold, it's actually down for the month, but it's up 27% of the year. It's been an important part of the portfolio, particularly in the active portfolio. Uh, we continue to, to hold it. We will continue to hold it. We think in an era of, of governments, first world governments printing money, gold will probably become even more important. We caution against people being completely gold mad. Um, you will see the scaremongers and the fearmongers say you should have everything in gold or silver. We always believe that's dangerous, just as we always believe speculation or lack of diversification is dangerous. But we think gold is an important part of the portfolio and it's helped our portfolios perform well considering the circumstances. That performance against repeated there. Um, yeah, and as, as much as we don't like negatives or flat years, fairly happy with performance at all levels at the moment particularly when you consider we're in the ditch. If we do get a good result out of this, markets will go up dramatically and all those performances will be back above their long-term targets. Property markets are fascinating. So this is the, do the data from Core Logic on Australian property prices. So we see the year-on-year -year change and the month-on-month. -month. So during the month of June, we're seeing a slight downturn, about 1% across most Australian capital cities. Now 1% on a million dollar house is, is, is sort of $10,000. So it's not a big um, downturn. You could argue it's quite modest considering what's happening. And when you look at the year on year, Sydney and Melbourne are still up double digits, 10 to 13%. Brisbane's up 5% over the year. Um, Adelaide and Perth, not so good, but that was, they were in that state beforehand. The average of all the capital cities is still up 9% over last year and down just under 1% over the last month. Um, there's been a lot of predictions by the doom and gloom merchants that property prices are going to collapse in Australia. Um, I don't subscribe to that camp. I think there'll be weakness like we're seeing, um, but I believe there's also some strength in some areas. Our own Sunshine Coast here, uh, very strong at the moment. Um, and there's, there's, there's some markets that are doing very well. And if we go to our friends at Heron Todd White with their property clock, um, lots of changes there. All that orange is, is changes from last month. It tells you the clock, the clock's changing rapidly at the moment. Yeah, they have places, there's not too many that they consider at the bottom of the clock. Um, Perth's still there. Um, at the start of the recovery, you've got places like South, Southwest, um, WA, Southern Highlands. You've got places rising. Uh, most of them are regional, by the way. Um, Sunshine Coast is, they've got is approaching peak. I think the Sunshine Coast has still got a long way to go before it's peaked, by the way. They've got places like Adelaide, etc., on top. This is not meant to be highly predictive. It's just trying to tell you where things are in the cycle. And yeah, they've changed some of those things around quite dramatically, but I do find it interesting. And I love the concept of the property clock. None of these things are perfect. They're just models. Um, we're very comfortable with people investing um, in certain places, um, particularly Southeast Queensland, at the moment, um, but property prices for the next five years will be very much affected by population growth and economic growth. If we were to shut the borders, um, which I don't think we ever should because that would kill our property um, cycle completely. Um, Australia's had good property growth over the last 40 years because we've had economic growth plus, plus um, population growth. The units, much the same, not too much difference there. You can read this in the attached transcript. So just finish off by reinforcing the process. Um, all our clients, all of you have portfolios that are based on your goals and those, ba those goals are based on your life and what's important to you. The portfolio is designed to do that. We take a long-term view. That means we can ride through crisis like this. We can enjoy the long-term returns that get 
we have massive diversification and enough liquidity to get through any crisis. Most of the portfolios, we tap into low cost index funds for about 70% of the portfolios. That gives us good returns without too much cost and the protection in the short term for our retired clients, that's by having enough reserves and for our clients that are still building their wealth, that's by continuing to buy dollar cost averaging during market downturns. And as I said, we've rebalanced regularly as an investment committee during this crisis. And every time we sit down with clients, we're topping up reserves or, or spending them, depending on what's important. So that personalized stuff. And then the key is avoiding the big mistakes. And there is only three ways to lose money in the share market. That's panicking and sell when the markets are down. That's having to sell when the markets are down or that's being not properly diversified. If you get those things right in the long run, you win and we're all in it for the long run if we've protected ourselves for the short run. Thank you for listening if you got this far. Um, always look forward to any feedback on this. We get some good feedback. If you've got any topics you'd like me to talk about, please feel free to email back or let us know and I look forward to catching up with you when next we talk at either review or at a new phone call. Thank you and have a great day.